This is an action by Jeffrey Mason in which he has claimed he has been defamed by publishing of defamatory quotation purportedly said by him but never said by him. Do you take the position that every misquote gives rise to an inference of actual malice? I, I take the position uh, that every misquote that is defamatory, he has a right to expect that he will not have a fabricated defamatory quote. And what he says is that you're great in the, she tells him you're great in the bedroom, but you're a total embarrassment outside. Now that doesn't fit any definition of intellectual gigolo, nor of any gigolo. He was not quoted to say, I am an intellectual gigolo. He was quoted as saying, they treated me like an intellectual gigolo. He never once said that the analyst will ever think he's great. In fact, he said just the opposite, and she knew all of this. The First Amendment protects a writer accused of misquotation unless the plaintiff can show that the writer strongly suspected that he was misrepresenting the gist of what was said. Petitioner alleged that he had been quoted as saying, analysis stands or falls with me now. And he says, in truth, Mason never said such. So he is accusing Janet Malcolm of a total fabrication with this quote. It turned out that we had absolute evidence of this quote because this quote was on the tape. The standard for evaluating actual malice would be, did the writer knowingly change the defamatory substance of that statement? If you did not have any knowing lie at all, you thought everything you said was was the truth, then, there's, then there cannot be a remedy under the First Amendment. But here you do have one unquestionable lie. You know that that quote was not uttered. The knowing lie creates the inference of malice. A fabricated quotation may injure reputation in at least two senses, either one giving rise to a conceivable claim in defamation. Injure because it attributes an untrue factual assertion to the speaker. Second, regardless of the truth or falsity of the factual matters asserted within the quoted statement, the attribution may result in injury to reputation because the manner of expression. Applying these standards to the case before us, we conclude that many of the statements of which petitioner complains do in fact convey a substantially different meaning than the tape-recorded statements and therefore evidence the requisite falsity.